We're going to buzz through the material on the uh, lecture notes so that I can give you some, uh, some study notes for the exam next week. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. All right. Christianity <coughs> established. I think I mentioned this last week. The father of the Pope of the Roman Church, the church hierarchy that came from the Roman Church government. They, uh, the Roman Catholic Church structured their church government after the Roman system. Uh, bishops throughout the world had influence. Of course, the most influential bishop in the Roman Church, Roman Catholic Church, was the Pope of Rome. And then uh, after Constantine legalized Christianity in 313, and especially after he called the Celts from Nicaea, the church structured itself after the Roman government organization. Now, um, one thing to be aware of there uh, is that over the course of, say, four or five hundred years, there were different papal announcements called papal bulls issued by the Pope at Rome. And they would say certain things at, at, that would affect the way the church would work and the way the church would be structured. And it happened different times over the course of, say, four or five hundred years following, uh, well, it's happened ever since then, but in particular how the Catholic Church is structured today was grounded in the time frame of about <coughs> 600 or so A.D. till about 11 or 1200 A.D. For example, you had the issue of the celibacy of the priesthood. That was made by a pope. That was stated by a pope that priests should remain unmarried, which is odd because the first pope of the Catholic Church was who? Peter. Peter, who had a mother-in-law, mother which means he had a wife. So just some odd things of that sort, some other certainly challenging issues with the Roman Catholic Church. We'll talk about a few of those at the beginning of the next quarter when we deal with the Reformation. And the Reformation was a reaction against the corruption and the problems theologically and practically and actually within the Catholic Church. And so Luther and Zwingli and others reacted against uh, the Catholic Church kind of control system. Uh, and we have the Protestant Reformation. So we'll deal with that next quarter. Just give you kind of a framework there. Uh, let's do something a little different. And by the way, all these notes are posted online. Uh, in the, on, the, on Moodle, you're welcome to pull them off and use them in your studies uh, and use them for other things. But I like to look at Middle Age from art and architecture. Look at the, the early Middle Ages in particular in light of art and architecture. And there's a reason for that. So let's, uh, let's look at this. In, in the, the church controlled the age. I mean, the Middle Ages is known as the age of Christendom. Uh, it's one of the reasons for the pejorative term, the Dark Ages. <coughs> There's an assumption among many, in the, particularly been in those that have been affected by the Enlightenment, where you get the, this mindset that Christians are not as smart, they're anti-intellectual, they're anti-rational, that type of thing. Uh, they look at the Middle Ages and see that the church controlled the Middle Ages, and so they pejoratively use the term Dark Ages. It's not actually accurate. There were tons of advances in the Middle Ages. You just don't hear about them because it doesn't support the narrative that the Dark Ages were dark because of uh, Christianity. But one of the things that you do see in the Middle Ages, as the church began to gain influence and have control and have wealth and have an ability to move beyond just <clears throat> running from their, for their lives based on persecution, they had control, they had power, they had authority, which was problematic in many areas. But one of the things they did is they used their art and architecture to display God's glory. They looked at the buildings they would build and at the paintings they would paint and at the designs that they would put together as a way to depict truth or depict God's glory. And so we're going to see some examples of that. Um, first, does anybody know what that is? What does it look like? Buddhist temple. It almost looks like a mosque. Buddhist temple almost looks like a mosque. Oh my gosh! It's like if, I, I know where it's in. Uh, it's in uh, <clears throat> Today it is a mosque. It's from the it's a, it's from the B, right? It's from the Byzantine Empire. Is it the Basilica? No, it's not the Basilica. Never mind. I don't know. It's called the Hagia Sophia. Uh, in Latin, that would be the Church of the Holy Wisdom. It was built by Emperor Justinian around 500 or so A.D. 
It's massive. It's absolutely massive. But what do you, it looks like a dome, right? Yet it's a church. So who copied who? When did Islam come about? Somebody's bright. We haven't talked about it in 600 years. AD. Yeah, 670. This was built in the 500s. So who copied who? Mm -hmm. Muslims copied the Christians. That's right. That's the, as a point of observation. That's the Church of the Holy Wisdom. It was, uh, it was beautifully uh, ornate on the inside. It had all kind of painting and artwork on the inside to describe and display the <coughs> The stories of the scripture and the stories of the Christian church. Uh, Emperor Justinian spared no expense when he put the church together, when he built the church. It was absolutely gorgeous. Now since and Emperor Justinian, the Byzantine Empire, which was the Roman Empire, moved to Constantinople. Eventually that was overrun by the Ottoman Turks, 1453. They were Muslim. They came in and plastered the walls to cover up the biblical stories. And then it turned into a mosque. Technically, I don't think it actually operates as a mosque today. I think it operates more as like a museum. But it was a mosque for a period of time, Stephen. Church of the Holy Wisdom. Why so big? Yes, sir. Uh, are the walls still plastered today? In many places. I think some have been pulled off for the sake of museum, but I, I, don't, I don't think you can walk in and see it as it was when it was built 500 years ago. Why so big? Just show up God's glory. Yeah. When you walked in, it's kind of like the Capitol building. Anybody been to the Capitol building in D.C.? It's supposed to be big. Because it, the, the, the impression is that when you walk in, this government and this nation is bigger than one person. That's the impression it's supposed to give. That's the same thing that was true when you walked into this church. Emperor Justinian wanted you to walk in and think, Wow. There's a lot of space here. God's bigger than I am. That was the, the desired impression. And that happened with the, the Church of the uh, Hagia Sophia, Church of the Holy Wisdom. Uh, and you have Romanesque architecture, which, how many of you have been in, in a cathedral? Ever wondered why the ceilings are so high? Same reason. Same reason. You walk in. They wanted the impression to be God is great, God is grand, God is far better than we are. In Romanesque architecture, you have the uh, uh, the arches that are smooth or that are rounded. Gothic architecture, the art the arches are pointed. Uh, if you notice at the top, see the points there. It's just an odd difference. But uh, most churches that were built in the Middle Ages were not in the shape of the Hagia Sophia, where it was a dome or it was something along those lines. They're built in this shape. They're a cross. Shape of a cross. How many of you, uh, your home church is a long, straight church building? the church I grew up in, church preaching. It's not great for uh, communication purposes. If you're trying to talk to people and see, it's just not good. Because even if you're a third full or if you're half full, there are patches. It makes you look less than full. You know that from you know preaching from a, to a congregation. And it's just kind of patchy. Uh, it's not right, wrong, or different. It just is. But why are they building that? in that frame, it's because they've always built in that frame. Generally speaking, it's just a, a throwback to the way things always were. In the Catholic system, uh, what is priority? You might know what's priority in a Catholic church service. What's the most important thing? Communion. Yeah, Mass. Mass, yeah. Communion. Not preaching. In the Catholic church, <coughs> the Catholic church strayed from biblical truth. Uh, because a rite and ritual cannot keep you pure, biblically speaking or theologically speaking. Only God's Word can, which is the reason for the Protestant Reformation. But in light of that, communication wasn't the purpose of building the churches. Participating in communion was. 
And so the way people would go to church, you'd go to church, you'd sit down, and then you would come forward to the very center of the church, right at the front, and you'd participate in communion. It's as if you're partaking of the cross every time you come forward to participate in church life. I heard, I heard it said that during the Catholic Mass, you're, they're essentially crucifying Christ every time they do it. Yep. That's how I've heard it put exactly right. So that's the uh, it's the structure. Of course, Gothic architecture has the pointed spires, pointed arches. And again, big to show off God's glory. At least that was in their mind what they were to do. Now let me ask a question before we go on. We'll look at a couple other frames of artwork in a second. Should churches be big? <clears throat> I don't think it matters. What? I don't, well, I don't think so. Let me, really, let me really, restate really the question. Building. Should a church building be big? <clears throat> Just as a matter of opinion for me, I believe the money should be spent on outreach more than, than to build big, braggadocious buildings. Okay. I feel like it depends on your needs. <clears throat> like if you have a big congregation, you don't need to have a small church. But, I mean, I think it just depends on your needs. Okay. Many churches could have multiple services and not, and I, again, reading David Platt and, and kind of getting a, a newer idea, his church wanted to build a new church. They wanted to build this multi-million dollar. He said, why don't we just do multiple services and send missionaries on the field with that money? Mm -hmm. First Baptist Dallas built a $130 million sanctuary. Mm hmm and, and I looked at that and I thought, now that's impressive. And when people come to town, they're going to go, wow. But how many people would have heard the gospel with $130 million? See, I, I agree with the fact it's based on the ministry. Like he's in your church. And your church is like a beehive. There's something going on in every room. Big don't necessarily mean to be something just to show off. It's something that we can use for the glory of God. Okay. Other thoughts? I, th I think like, Kind of to go along with Rodney, Nick, and everybody. It's it's a matter of, of what you need. Because, I mean, like, some people would feel like, you know, multiple services or, you know, satellite campuses or anything like that. You know, that's splitting the congregation. Like, and if you want to bring them together, you just build a bigger sanctuary to bring them all together. But saying that, if you do not need to, like, if it's, abs if it's not absolutely necessary, then, I mean, it's just a very tertiary argument of, you know, okay, well, what is your needs here? It depends on the situation, I would think. <clears throat> but to say that we need to build a church that's ornate and decorated like that, I think that goes against what even what, what Christ would would ever want. You know? Really? Yeah. I mean, Christ said. So you, you know, think for fifteen hundred years of church history, he's been displeased with every cathedral that's been built in his name? Well, Christ said, that, you know, he, he he wasn't really much for the treasures of this world. <laughs> he said we should store up treasures in heaven instead of here. Well, God moved on Solomon to pull the cedars and build that beautiful, you know, temple. So, yeah. And the cathedrals of the Middle Ages pale in comparison to Solomon's temple. Yeah. Well, I'll say, if you just take it to the Bible and just see the purpose of Noah building his ark was for a purpose, and it was humongous. You know, so if people go out and build a church, it's going to be for a purpose, and it's going to be served and used, like you say, for a purpose. But if you build a small church, it's going to be used for the like William say, for the same or what Nick say, for the same amount of people. So you're building it according to the location where it's at, and what's the purpose behind building this big church? I've seen churches start from hotels to move to, you know. They in conference rooms to build a big church because the church group, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They didn't just go out and say, okay, let's build a big church and then see if we can bring mm -hmm. people in. They built it because they were growing, they was put, they was growing out of the little small where they started at. So I think if you have a purpose behind what you're building, they go for it, big or small. A lot of the, the works that God's blessing the most, they don't even have a building. I was in Brazil and they don't in Korea, in China, in a lot of these places where they just go out in the middle of the bush and they meet, 
they don't have any desire to build a building. They just worship together and they don't have the focus of, of that. Now I know in America we build impressive buildings because we as Americans want to be a part of an impressive church. Nobody wants to go to a, a church out in the bush in America and say, yeah, I'm a part of the bush church. You know, we want to be a part of a church like Mud Creek or, or First Baptist Hendersonville. But a lot of the churches around the world, I mean, I met in, in Mexico City, they literally had walls with no roof, and it was slammed. I mean, people were standing outside worshiping. Mm -hmm. And they had no responsibilities except they were sending missionaries to America, all over the world, mm -hmm. with the money. You guys are smart. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, these are some smart folks. Hey, I think a lot of times big churches uh, also, uh, they, they don't scare people, but people that just like lost, they kind of like afraid. When they see them big churches, they kind of like afraid of them because they know that you're going into a mass majority of people that's believers that come every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that uh, if you build small churches in small communities and small towns, it might be a little bit more effective because of the fact that they may feel a little bit more secure going into a smaller church versus man, look at this huge church with all these nice cars out in the parking lot and they just, like some low poverty people just needing Jesus, yeah. they're going to be like, man, you know, this, this I might just keep going because this is yeah. all for show, but it's not for me, you know what I'm saying? So it's, but also there's the flip side of that coin where you have people who just kind of want to sneak into the service and get a little bit of what they got and then sneak right out. Because, right, yeah. I mean, in the smaller church, like, you go to a church with... You know, 50, 60. Yeah, 50, 60 people. I mean, if you're a guest, they know you're a guest. Yeah, you like, stared down. We had a guy come the other day off the streets, and he was just, I mean, everybody, you could tell he, I mean, my church probably had 50, 60 people. Yeah. And he was just sitting there, like, you know what I mean? He had a regular t shirt on. And, um, you know, he felt, I mean, he seemed like he was welcome. You know? I mean, there's plenty of churches around town, yeah. but the church I go to is a small church. So yeah. he said he came to this church because. He heard about it and he walked by it all the, all the time and he see it. I mean, it's not nothing extravagant. It's nothing big. It's just a known brick church, you know. So. And I think it just goes back to that person, like as a person, you know, what their thought process is right. and whatnot. My church is a small church. We have <clears throat> 35 every Sunday. So, But we're also at told to give our best to God. So if our best is a small church, then that's what we should have. If our best is to, he wants us to go to a big church, then that's what we should do. Y'all write this word down in your notes. Those of you that are taking notes, it's called ecclesiology. Ecclesiology, E C C L E S I O L O G Y. <coughs> before I before I tell you the answer, what is it? Does anybody know what that is? Study of the church. Study of the church. Ecclesia is the called out ones. It's the, the uh, New Testament word for church, Greek word for church, and the ology, of course, is study of, so it's the study of the church. Those of you that are going to be in, uh, in pastoral ministries, uh, senior pastors, youth ministers, associate ministers, which is probably most of you in sub-capacity, you should do a fair amount of reading on ecclesiology. It's the study of the church. And it doesn't, practically speaking, church buildings and construction are a part of that discussion, but how you view the church leading up to those construction ideas and topics and discussions, it will be important for you to have uh, in your mind what, what is a church. You know, Because <coughs> churches exist in China where there are house churches, and churches exist in Africa where there are bush churches. And I was in a church in South Africa that was essentially a shed. <laughs> and you could get about 30 or 40 people in there. And we had 75 in there one night. I mean, so, you, I mean, it was... It was Packed, but it was, but it was just like everything else in the in the township or the little village. That was their houses. Their houses were sheds, and so their church mirrored their culture. Okay, so there are some things to think about in constructing a building. Uh, one thing I would say is, if you get to that point in your life in ministry where you're talking with a church uh, about a construction project. Don't just automatically minimize the person that wants to build it big and ornate. I don't so much mean massive, but I mean beautiful and spend money to make it beautiful. Don't just automatically dismiss them and say, no, we can't do that because we need to win people to Jesus. 
Don't, don't make it an either or automatically. I'm not saying you shouldn't have that discussion. I'm saying don't be dismissive of that person. Because that person may be thinking, and you might want to flesh this out, may be thinking they want it beautiful because they think God's beautiful. Mm-hmm. They want people to walk in and notice we think and we care about our church building because we think God is great and glorious and worthy of our attention. At the very least, our churches should be clean, yeah. should be well kept, at the very <clears> least. <throat> and I don't mean perfect. No, no, I'm sure. wrong. They should be lived in. But they shouldn't be, you shouldn't be ratty as best we can. Now, I realize that's dependent on every church situation and culture and area as well. But let me just, let's just shoot straight. Here in the United States, we have the privilege and the opportunity and the responsibility to keep our houses clean, our businesses clean, and our churches can be clean too. That's right. All right? You want to reach people, be inviting. Uh, and one way to be inviting is just to keep a clean building. That's not the only thing. And certainly it's not the most important thing, but, you know, let, let a family walk in with kids and take them to the nursery, and you've got ratty equipment in the nursery, stuff that was used in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. You think you're going to have families stay? Nope. Nope. I, I visited a church, I don't know, a few months back, and I walked into the children's area. The adult areas had beautiful carpet. Children's area had old orange, I mean, it was like orange, gold, it wasn't shag, it was something different. And it was just ugly. Okay? Well, I mean, that's perception. When you walk into the environment, it should be, it should, it should be attractive to the people that you're not, your goal is trying to make church attractive, but if you walk in, I mean, think about it this way. When was the last time you went to a restaurant that was not clean, 89 rating on the, and ratty carpet? When was the last time you did? Did you ever go back? Or did you walk out if you saw a restaurant with it? Walked out. Or you didn't eat there. Or you never went back. Well, think about people coming to your church. So just because we have a view that says we need it to be beautiful or big or glorious, that's not necessarily wrong. I'm not saying it's necessarily right either. I'm not saying that's the view we ought to prescribe to you. I just want to offer that for 1,500 years, that's been the way church buildings, when they were built, were built. With grandness and glory as a display of God's glory and as a nod back to the temple. I'm not saying we have to do that. I'm just saying don't be automatically dismissive. Now, with that being said, I respect David Platt incredibly, uh, especially for his move at the Church of Brook Hills, not to build bigger, but to send more money. And one of the things he was working uh, with is, what do we need? Do we need a bigger building, or can we do with what we have? And there's a big difference. There are some churches in some situations that need a building. Okay, their building was built in the 40s. All right? In Mud Creek, we built our sanctuary, current sanctuary, in, uh, completed in 95, but we're in it three times. So we do multiple services in, in a pretty good-sized building, but we use it too. It's not just something that sits for one service. Um, and I would encourage you to think about multiple services. I say, is that, is that a divided church? Well, let me just ask you a question. When Paul wrote the letter, any of the letters, but particularly the letter to the church at Ephesus, what church was he writing to? The Ephesian church. The Ephesian church. Do you think that meant in one place? Probably a lot of Ephesian churches. He appointed elders, according to the book of Acts, many elders. Why do you think he appointed multiple elders to the church? <clears throat> there were multiple churches. Or was a big church. But he didn't say the churches in Ephesus. He said the church in Ephesus. He was either planning for uh, growth or there was growth taking place. What do you think about this? What do you think if it was one church in multiple locations? What if you th- what do you think if Paul had in mind the church in Ephesus had you know thousands of people in it, but they met in multiple houses because they didn't have church buildings, and the elders came together for various purposes and reasons. In other words, Having a multiple venues or multiple locations or multiple 
uh, services, that doesn't divide the church. It doesn't. I mean, there are plenty of things that could divide the church. Just simply having a different space or a different worship time, that doesn't divide the church. At all. If it did, then churches in China are in trouble. To the tons of house churches. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's why you should study ecclesiology. Study the church. Figure out what, what your view of the church is and why that matters. And why does it matter? Because it matters for practical reasons. And I can't think of anything more practical than thinking of spending you know, five or six, seven hundred thousand dollars or a couple million dollars on building a new building. Just think about that for a moment. If that's something that comes into play, you ought to be well prepared and well versed in a discussion about it, right? Right. Again, because you as a leader or as a pastor or as a staff member ought to know more about this particular topic than probably the rest of your congregation. Just as not that's just observation. All right. Let's move on. Byzantine mosaic. Everybody, everybody know what a mosaic is in terms of artwork? Someone who takes little pieces of, uh, of pottery or painted, uh, something that's painted, and they piece it together. Kind of pretty, but it's flat. It's not 3D. Uh, <coughs> it's the nature of a mosaic. That's art in the uh, this particular time frame in the early Middle would, Ages. Would you say that like stained glass windows would be mosaic? Uh, not technically a mosaic. But it's similar, and I've got a picture of those coming up, too. Uh, Byzantine art, or art in the Middle Ages, is also art as a depiction of truth, not just a God's glory. What, what event is that? Peter Yeah, Jesus' arrest, Judas kissing Jesus on the cheek, Peter cutting, uh, Aga, is it Agabus? Malchus. Malchus. Malchus, off. Don't know what's going on with the guy in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Picasso what? before Picasso or something. <laughs> anyway, this era was not known for its glorious art, maybe glorious architecture, but not known for its glorious art. The goal of art in this era was to depict truth. Here's the story. Here's the event. It's a way to tell a story to people, in particular because many people were uh, uh, illiterate. They couldn't read or they didn't have access to God's Word. And also, stained glass was important for Roman Catholic churches because church services were in Latin. After a certain period of time, the, the, the Pope issued a statement and said, we're going to do all our Mass in Latin. Well, if you're a good German or if you're a Spaniard or if you're an Italian and you didn't know Latin, what would happen? You were looking at the windows. Yeah. Your understanding of scriptural history and the Bible would come from your viewing the stained glass. <clears throat> Do you think um, they didn't make the artwork as spectacular because, well, because they wanted to show the story, but if they made it spectacular, people would be more interested in <clears throat> its beauty? Well, I, I don't know that that was intentional. I don't know that, that was an intentional thought process. <coughs> much of the uh, much of what we know as glorious art had not come about yet, and we'll see that uh, when we look at the Renaissance, the beginning of next quarter. The Renaissance period was a shift, particularly uh, you know, in, uh, particularly related to art, right. uh, and so they actually made art beautiful for beauty's sake, but still told biblical stories or historical stories. That was the content of their art. <coughs> So I don't know that it was an intentional move on their part on to make it glorious. I just think, you know, that hadn't happened in the history of art. It wasn't. A, it wasn't something where they said, "Let's do this to be beautiful." Although stained glass, much stained glass is actually pretty beautiful. But it's not. I mean, it, it's not <clears throat> priceless artwork in the sense of what you would have with Leonardo and Michelangelo and the others of the Renaissance and then those following them. So. Uh, what made them decide to, or when did they start making Christian figures like, look like us? I mean, to think of Jesus as a, a Jewish man in the you know, Mediterranean, he didn't look like that. He didn't look like us. But 
I think that has been, uh, I'll be honest with you, I think that's the, the bane, that's a strong word, I think that's the challenge of every culture, is not creating a Jesus that looks like us. I think we struggle with that. I think our culture struggles that, with that. And practically speaking, it comes through in our artwork. Uh, but it also comes through in, in the way we think Jesus would express himself in our culture today. I think most conservatives would say Jesus would be Republican. Okay. I mean, if I, you read Facebook, I mean, I know, I know people on Facebook that, I mean, Jesus wouldn't have voted for Obama and he would be a Republican. I also know some people on the other side of the fence that are theologically liberal that G Jesus would be a Democrat. We tend to think of Jesus in terms of our own perspectives. Uh, classic liberalism, theological liberalism from the 19th century. Uh, Karl Barth, uh, and he was not a, not a liberal in that sense. He had some problems with his theology. Um, classical liberalism was not one of them, but he, made the, he critiqued classical liberalism because he said what liberals have done is created Jesus in their own image. They've taken everything out of Jesus that would be supernatural or that would be offensive or that would be problematic or that would not fit contemporary culture and described a Jesus that would fit a pastor or a church leader in you know, the 1890s in New York City. And that's a problem. It's a problem for every age. So I think that's it's just displayed here. I think... This is a, this would be in a European church, so Jesus would look European. Now, I, I, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but I think it's something we need to be aware of. Now, in some instances of whatever the culture believes is beautiful is what they'll make That's Jesus right. to be. And uh, for example, in in Ecuador, in certain parts of Ecuador, I don't know if I can't say that for the entire place, but um, there were. Um, Pictures and I mean somewhere on the side of a mountain, you know, uh, a guy's got a, a picture of Jesus. He's got blue eyes. Every every picture you see in Ecuador that I that I was that I ran into, blue eyes. And uh, as a matter of fact, I even we uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the girls that went on a trip with us had blonde hair and blue eyes, and like everybody was like thought she was the most beautiful thing they've ever seen before in their life. And uh, I had an old guy. Um, whose grandson, I think, moved to the United States, married a white woman, and they have a child that their his granddaughter has blue eyes, and he was like he just carried a picture of her, like with this up close picture of her blue eyes, and showed everybody, and uh, like it was the most amazing thing. So Jesus has blue eyes in Ecuador. <laughs> yeah, we we want we want Jesus to be the best of what we think is. True and beautiful and right, generally speaking. China. Is there a certain reason in all these the paintings and drawings of Christ that he's got a light around his head? The displays. It's just, it displays holiness. It's a halo. That's what I thought. I just want to check. Yeah, I mean, you see that with the pictures of the Madonna, as well, which would be Mary, uh, the halo around their head, and in many cases you see that with other saints as well. It's just it's a way to set apart. It's not always true in all the paintings there, but it is a way to set apart uh, the holy from the unholy. It's one of the things they did to be distinctive. And our stained glass. In contrast, what is that? Yeah, the Michelangelo Sistine Chapel. Who is that character? It's God. It's God. The biceps. <laughs> He's a man. He's a man. He's a man. God is spirit, right? Right. No, he doesn't. He took on flesh in the person of his son Jesus. But Michelangelo's God, Michelangelo's Adam, and we'll look at Adam next quarter when we look at some art. They weren't pictures of um, necessarily. The goal of their pictures was not necessarily to display a truth, as it was to display a uh, a certain. Um, well, the ideal, the ideal human, and to lift up <coughs> the standard of humanity. So art shifted and changed in the Renaissance period. Michelangelo would be a Renaissance artist. So there's, here's a timeline, if you'll write this down. Uh, skip Charlemagne, we're not going to talk about him, so you don't need to write that down.
But the early Middle Ages, AD 450 to 1050, you have the rise of the church influence. So the Middle Ages was the age of the church, the Roman Catholic Church in particular. You had the establishment of Islam, which is about AD 610. We'll talk about that briefly uh, in just a few minutes in the next set of slides. You had the empowerment of the papacy, where the Roman bishop, the bishop of the Church of Rome, became known as the Pope of the Church of Rome and was given, uh, at least to some degree, um, absolute power. What the Pope said was next was what God said. And essentially that established Roman Catholic Church tradition on equal footing with Scripture as authoritative. You had the issues of monasticism and literacy. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes as well. Skip Charlemagne, it's important for Western history. We just don't have enough time to go into all of that, the, Holy, the New Holy Roman Empire and those types of things uh, in France and in uh, Middle Europe. We just don't have enough time to do that. You also had the renewal of the seven Roman liberal arts. <coughs> the trivium, which would be grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And the quadrivium, which is arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. So that was the educational model for uh, particularly the beginning <coughs> places of colleges and universities in, uh, <coughs> in Europe and the Middle Ages. If I'm not mistaken, Dr. Thompson is going to be taking over the research class or the computer class or something. Uh, I'm sure. research right now. So I think he's going to do research and computers. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not. I may not be sure. I may not, may be wrong in the exact way that's going to work. But anyway, he's going to spend time dealing with logic. If he hasn't already done that with the group that walks in. Um, why do you think logic and rhetoric and grammar go together? Because those are the building blocks of knowledge. Building blocks of communication, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. He ain't got no righteousness. <laughs> Who's that going to convince? People in the South? <coughs> Maybe. Oh. Maybe. Some people in the South. <laughs> My point is that if you want to be someone, and rhetoric is the art of communication, the art of argumentation. Logic is the basis in which we argue, a foundation for that. But if you don't have good grammar that grounds that, you limit your ability to communicate. It's why we have English classes here. It's why you should be a good student of grammar and speak well. It doesn't mean you speak perfectly. It just means you should speak well. And by, by the way, you're communicating the greatest story that's mm -hmm. ever been discussed on the face mm -hmm. of the planet. Why wouldn't we want to do that well? How many of you like steak? Yes, amen. New York Strip? Yeah. My personal favorite is a ribeye. Ribeye. Yes. You ever served a ribeye on a styrofoam plate? No. Yeah. That would be psycho. You have? I uh, have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get plate, uh, uh, styrofoam plate because I didn't have enough to eat You do what you got to do. Yes, sir. Would you serve a guest a ribeye on a styrofoam plate? Would you have... Would you have uh, our president, Dr. Horton, over to your house no. cooking steaks and serving on a <clears throat> plate? So why would we give the gospel to those who need to hear it through the medium of <clears throat> Just food for thought. I know sometimes it's frustrating to try to learn things that you don't see how they connect to preaching the gospel and serving the Lord, but they do, and they matter, and they're important. Just observation. I've eaten steak on a styrofoam plate, too. I just 
wouldn't serve that to a guest. 